Hello and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday, December 9th. I'm Kate Andrews, the Spectator's Economics Editor, and your host this week. I think it's worth reflecting before we dive into the show on this week's press conference and the introduction of Plan B COVID restrictions. There are lots of theories going around about the timing of these announcements, why more mass mandates, working from home guidance, and most controversially, the introduction of vaccine passports were brought in after being ruled out by the Deputy Prime Minister just a day before. We'll dig into those theories on the show, but I want to focus now on the press conference itself. There's been plenty to challenge in the countless COVID press conferences we've had on and off for the better part of two years. Patrick Valance's infamous chart last October, for example, showing one scenario of cases surging and nothing else. But Wednesday's press conference was another level of spin. What the Prime Minister and his advisors were saying did not translate to what the graphs on the screen were showing us. The metrics that matter most, hospitalizations and death, have been flatlined for some time now. So in order to claim that the data, the science now required new restrictions, rushed in within a matter of hours, they came up with some disingenuous comparisons. Chris Whitty tried to draw parallels between the UK and South Africa, where he said hospitalizations were surging because of the new variant. South Africa's double vaccination rate for the whole population is 25%. In the UK, it's 70%. 95% of adults in England and in Scotland are estimated to have antibodies. 97% of the over 75s. These are not comparable countries. Witte also tried to draw comparisons between our world now with working vaccines, antivirals, and much better treatment and understanding of COVID-19, and our world last year without these things. He said of the link between infections and hospitalizations, quote, you've seen how things have gone before, that's probably the way to bet. And then if we're pleasantly surprised, nobody would be happier than he would be. How can that be said with a straight face? It certainly used to be the case when we didn't have vaccines that a soaring infection rate saw hospitalizations and deaths follow. But when the government opened in July and cases surged, we saw how well that link between infections and severe illness had been broken by the vaccines. It's not fully severed. It never will be. There are still reasons to be nervous, and the government could have laid out its Plan B strategy on that basis. The unknowns about the Omicron variant, their concerns about worst case scenarios, about a health service that is designed to operate on the brink of catastrophe, still unable to cope with any kind of unexpected plot twist. But to claim that Plan B is based on the data, the data we have right now, it doesn't add up. And to claim last year's experience without vaccines should be looked at to compare to this year's experience with vaccines and boosters, why are they talking down the jabs? This spin would be a problem at any time, but it matters now especially. Accepting the principle of vaccine passports fundamentally changes the relationship between the individual and the state. This is a landmark moment and the government has taken this leap without any evidence that we need them and without any evidence that they work. Across Europe, even within the UK, we can look at Scotland. These passports have so often failed to make any meaningful difference. Over half of this year has been spent living under some level of COVID restrictions. We weren't able to sit on a park bench with another person for three months this year because we were told to hang in there. The vaccines are the solution and they are the solution. But what's the solution now if they're saying this is no longer the case? What's the exit strategy for reversing Plan B and frankly, at some point, ditching the rules that still existed within Plan A? How can we trust they're going to follow the data when they spin it so ruthlessly? Does anyone believe that next Monday, when working from home guidance comes in, that ministers in Whitehall will be following it? Nothing this week or the entire pandemic would suggest that rule makers are subject to what they mandate for the rest of us. And on that note, onto this week's show. Vaccine passports are a go for nightclubs and big venues. Working from home is back and Boris Johnson wants to start a national conversation about mandatory jabs. The PM introduced new COVID restrictions as his government was floundering over a party they allegedly didn't have last December. Do they have any credibility? I'll speak to our politics team. 
The Omicron variant is spreading fast through the UK. How serious is it? We'll speak to Professor Alistair Grant. It was meant to be the government's crime week where they unveiled their plan to crack down on drug usage and to try to help people into rehabilitation. Dame Carol Black, who came up with the plan, and former Tory leader Ann Duncan Smith will join us. Is Russia about to invade Ukraine? Putin held crisis talks with Biden earlier this week as troops and weaponry have massed at the border. But is NATO making the situation worse? We'll speak to Owen Matthews and former NATO advisor Angela Stent. And finally, give me, give me more Britney Spears content. It's the story of the year, let's be honest, and writer Sarah Didham reviews the book Being Britney in this week's magazine. She'll be on the show to tell us what she thinks. Before we get going, if you enjoy Spectator TV, you should subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the red subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. And why not subscribe to The Spectator magazine too? You can get 12 weeks of the magazine and a free £20 Amazon voucher for just £12. To take up the deal, go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer. First, the Prime Minister announced new restrictions yesterday, but after the number 10 party fiasco, does his government have any credibility? I'm joined now by Katie Balls and Isabel Hardman. Katie, to you first. It's been a big week in Westminster. Give us the highlights. Yes, I think lots of things have now happened, but ultimately I think where the point when the dial moved was uh, leaked footage um, of a practice Downing Street press conference in which senior Downing Street staff appear to joke about a Christmas party. Allegra uh, Stratton, at the time the Prime Minister's spokeswoman, um, being asked by a number 10 staffer, Ed Oldfield, um, ultimately, uh, you know, there are reports of a Downing Street Christmas party um, suggesting that this could be something she might get in a real briefing. And then the various people in the room joking about how to respond to that before saying, oh, the camera's on. Um, and then saying, oh, it's definitely a fictional party. Now, the reason this is particularly uh, curious is there's been reports rumbling on for about over a week now about a party that occurred in Downing Street on the 18th of December, cheese and wine, um, lots of different things, and it appears to be a reference to that, um, at a time when Boris Johnson and his team have spent days and days denying any such party existed. And I think that really opened things up. The Prime Minister has now uh, called for his Cabinet Secretary to launch an investigation into the party. Allegra Stratton has resigned. And it's all looking rather messy, more claims and questions being asked about various parties in 10 Downing Street. And then you add to that the Prime Minister's decision yesterday to announce that the UK is moving to plan beyond COVID in the face of the Omicron variant. Um, that raised eyebrows amongst his own MPs, who have really taken it back because senior figures in government have been saying, we can move to plan B, but we're still getting the data in. Uh, don't expect, you know, anytime soon. We have a review period, um, you know, uh, just before Christmas. And that's when we'll look at things. So it felt as though uh, a rapid move forward. And the prime minister has been accused of almost dead catting it, trying to bring in something else to dominate the headlines. The problem for the prime minister, as you can see in the various front pages um, at the end of this week, is that it appears to be saying, we will be doing uh, one rule for Downing Street staff, we can't follow restrictions too hard, but we expect everyone else to have more restrictions. So he is facing hypocrisy charges and a very angry Tory party already fed up about the fact that they are having to defend things which are tricky to defend um, that have may or may not have occurred in Downing Street, um, but uncomfortable conversations, and now also fed up at the fact that new restrictions are coming in. Many of them question whether things like vaccine passports are really necessary or effective. Isabel, a lot to dig into there. As Katie mentions, this all built up to the resignation of Boris Johnson's former press secretary turned COP26 spokesperson, Allegra Stratton. Do you think that her resignation takes the pressure off the Prime Minister? Is he going to get away with this, so to speak, this idea that the buck stops with her? I imagine that's his hope. That was certainly his strategy at Prime Minister's Questions this week, where he effectively threw his staff under a bus by saying he'd received repeated assurances that there hadn't been a party, uh, which in effect was him telling the Commons that he didn't know what was going on in his in his own building, admittedly quite a large building. Number 10 Downing Street is uh, deceptively uh, big. Um, and also that he thought that his uh, his staff might be lying to him, which, again, is uh, 
not the mark of a strong leader one way or the other if you if you think your staff are, are lying to you you don't know what they're up to and you think they're probably disloyal to you as well which which isn't great but this was his strategy for for being the person who survives this and gets other people to to take responsibility uh, on his behalf uh, i think that'll be his hope but talking to conservative mps i don't think that that's what's happening um not least because uh, allegra stratton uh, who obviously lots of us at the spectator know uh, her statement uh, this week was very sincere and was couched in sort of moral terms in the way that the prime minister would would probably never um speak and a lot of conservative mps and ministers who i've spoken to uh, since that statement uh were quite upset by it actually because they felt that somebody was taking responsibility in a way that the prime minister should have been um and they felt quite a lot of sympathy for stratton given she did as the leaked video uh, shows us uh, not even go to this party uh, that everyone was joking about so I think Conservative MPs feel that someone else needs to be taking responsibility. They expect that there will probably be more members of staff, but what they would like would be for it to be the Prime Minister. And they don't just mean it in terms of him actually telling the truth from the outset when accusations of parties are being levelled. They also mean um, him... Uh, taking responsibility for the COVID restrictions, the ongoing COVID restrictions that, as Katie said, they are getting more and more upset about. At the start of this week, you had former Prime Minister Theresa May, who I think it's fair to say now is is a serial rebel on the Conservative benches, but isn't, you know, one of the COVID recovery group sort of lockdown sceptic um, MPs complaining in the Commons that the government was continually turning the economy on and off again and that at some point it needed to learn to live with Covid and I think that the combination of a Downing Street as Katie said that appears not to be able to follow its own rules while still announcing restrictions on things um, it, it has really upset Conservative MPs and has really damaged um, what was already quite precarious loyalty to the Prime Minister. And speaking of those backbencher MPs, Katie, we now have Tory MPs who are being openly critical of the Prime Minister once again. Tiana Davidson, William Ragg, Angela Richardson have all come out to say they disagree with the government's plan for vaccine passports. The PM has faced rebellions on COVID measures before. So do these frustrations that are being voiced really matter? Look, at the moment, it seems Labour will support at least the bulk of these measures. Um, that was the strong suggestion in the chamber when Sajid Javid was announcing it. Sajid Javid facing calls to resign from his own MPs, but actually in West Streeting, the new shadow health secretary, um, finding support. So I think the bulk will pass, some asking questions over vaccine passports, but generally speaking, it seems Boris Johnson will get his way. But that's not the end of the matter. Um, it is a very dangerous situation and an uncomfortable situation for a Tory prime minister to pass measures on Labour votes, on opposition votes. And the fact you have this many number of Tory MPs already coming forward saying they disagree, they're not going to do this. Um, you have the whole weekend to go before you get to that vote. Some members of the payroll I've spoken to really um, adding things up, very uncomfortable, not sure whether to go through with this. I think it could be the biggest COVID rebellion we've seen to date from the Tory side. And this is a tricky place the Prime Minister has got himself into because I think it's that double whammy of your own team, uh, the building you're in charge of. You might say you don't know what's going on in it, but ultimately you're in charge of that ship. So if you don't know, there's questions on your grip. If you do know, there's questions on your honesty. Um, but also, by the way, when we add to the many things that have happened this week, have um, a new uh, judgments over the Downing Street flat refurbishment, if um, viewers can think back to think that, to that, with the Electoral Commission fining the, the party for um, the way it uh, reported the funding for that and now questions about whether Boris Johnson um, lied about what he knew as and when. Um, but I think the sense that Boris Johnson and his team have not been following the rules to the letter, Boris Johnson's team, combined with the new measures and the sense that if we are on a trajectory now by which you will um, ultimately have uh, cases going up that's something that will then concern the government and you could potentially have new measures um, Boris Johnson is going to be between a rock and a hard place. And I think this time, actually, it could be even more difficult um, for the Prime Minister because last time around, when his opposition, um, when his MPs were opposing him, you had a situation where he could promise vaccines. Well, a lot of people are vaccinated. What is the Prime Minister's um, answer to Omicron? Is it that 
booster jabs. We're seeing that a bit, but I think there's a wariness amongst MPs that they thought they'd got through this. Um, if we are heading to even tighter restrictions going into January and others, um, I, I do think the Prime Minister is going to struggle to sell that to his party. Isabel, what do you think the bigger threat is to Boris Johnson at the moment? The number 10 Christmas party or the COVID restrictions? It's the new COVID restrictions. Uh, the number 10 Christmas party and the way in which he's handled it have uh, aggravated all the feelings within the Conservative Party. But I, I think there's a... I think it's probably wrong to say that the public will stop obeying COVID restrictions because of what Downing Street were doing a year ago. I think it's too simplistic because if we look at what happened after the Barnard Castle um, uh, affair, actually people continued to obey lockdown restrictions and um, people continued to support lockdowns for, for, for far beyond um, that incident last year. Um, I think what it does do is it undermines trust within the parliamentary party. I think um, it undermines... Um, uh, the Prime Minister's authority in announcing these restrictions. And that's why these restrictions are the bigger problem, uh, because he is having to uh, swerve certain issues as well. So we have the bizarre situation and reflected in the front pages uh, today where you are being told to work from home from Monday, uh, but go to Christmas parties, which just doesn't make any sense. I mean, Perhaps our workplace is very standoffish, but 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 I think that generally at a Christmas party you tend to have more social contact than you do when you're sitting at your desk in the office, by and large. That that does tend to be the case. Uh, Katie, last question to you. What is your sense of how things are in number 10 at the moment? Are they calming down as we move into the end of the week or are they still very frazzled? Well, look, I think it's a frazzled team. And also you think about the Owen Patterson row. Boris Johnson and his team in number 10 have been facing negative headlines now for several weeks. Um, I don't think that's about to go away. I think the departure of Allegra Stratton has actually raised more questions. Um, if someone who didn't attend a party that may or may not exist, depending on uh, who you listen to, um, what about the people who might have attended this party? Um, it almost uh, sets a path in motion by which you would think more people would have to go if you, the level by which you're going on is, you know, joking about this party surely that people who were there would face tougher um, you know sanctions from from their boss um, so I think that's keeping going that's we're asking about more events um, you have Dominic Cummings who keeps pushing this idea um, of a party in the Downing Street flat to celebrate his departure um, and obviously lots of people have an agenda here but these are the things Downing Street is going to have to field and then again questions coming back about the flat refurbishment at a time when there's lots of tricky things with Covid so I think Getting to the end of the year is looking uh, uphill. And what we need to remember too is next week is the North Shropshire by-election. Now, long time Tory safe seat, Owen Patterson's former seat, he stepped down as a result of that um, sleaze scandal. It still would be a big upset if the Lib Dems were to take that. I think a lot of people would be surprised, but the Tories are increasingly nervous about it. And I think that if you see that majority, which is over 20,000, um, sufficiently slashed, um, if it goes yellow, I think that's a whole new territory. Um, again, that is another pressure point for Boris Johnson that he really doesn't need. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Isabel. There's no doubt, however, that the new Omicron variant is spreading throughout the UK. How bad is it? Professor Alistair Grant from the University of East Anglia has estimated that the R value is around 3.5. Remember, we were told it needed to be kept below 1 to keep things manageable. He joins me now. Professor, thanks for coming on Spectator TV. How much Omicron do you think is in the UK today? OK, so I'm actually working from the official data. So I'm working from the same data that the official advice is based on. Um, I can put the results of that analysis out faster because I don't have to go through the formal check to make sure that I've got everything absolutely right before it goes into the public domain. Mm -hmm. So based on that, on 6th of December, so that was Tuesday, um, about 6% of the cases of Omicron, uh, the cases of COVID that were detected in England were probably Omicron. That figure is probably higher in Scotland. 
I don't have access to the Scottish data, but it looks like the numbers, Scotland seems to be somewhat ahead of England and numbers there are likely to be higher than that. And we still don't know a lot about this variant. The work is patchy at best. We are getting more updates every day. But what do you think are the most important things to highlight about the variant right now? What are you seeing that's consistent in the studies that are coming back? I think the consistent pattern that's coming back is that the variant is growing very quickly. Numbers are doubling roughly every two and a half days. That's consistent with the pattern in South Africa. It's consistent with the data from Denmark. So wherever we look at it, numbers seem to be doubling around every two and a half days. What would that mean for Omicron in terms of competing with the Delta variant in the UK? They actually won't compete. They're in effect two independent, two independent organisms there. Um, well, so this, Delta is, this will... is interesting because so often, well, last winter anyway, um, when we moved into February, March time, there was talk about how Delta would overtake Kent. Uh, so you're suggesting that perhaps they're actually going to operate independently and we won't see a similar overtaking scenario. Eventually there will be an overtaking, but Delta will probably, Delta has been at around 50,000 cases a day for, since late summer, and it's likely to stay at that level. And Omicron will come in on top of that. So um, at the moment, about 6% of cases are Omicron. That is doubling, let's say, if it doubles every three days, then that will rapidly come up to the same sort of numbers as Delta. But it won't displace Delta because Delta infections are propagating independently. If measures are introduced to limit transmission, that will lead to a reduction in Delta. Um, but they're not really in competition at this stage. That's really interesting. Is there anything that we can see that's consistent about the way that Omicron patients are faring once they're infected? It's really too early to say. It takes about a week from initial infection before people are hospitalized. So the numbers are growing so rapidly that a week ago there were very few patients, very few, very few cases, and those people will just be um, at risk of hospitalization over the next few days. Um, so you think perhaps by this time next week, we're actually going to have a lot more data about this? We over the next one to two weeks, we will start to get information as to whether patients suffering from Omicron are more or less likely to be hospitalized. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some suggestions from elsewhere that it may be slightly less severe. Um, so the risks of an individual who catches Omicron may be reduced. Um, but if the numbers increase, then we may de be dealing with a, a smaller individual risk, but a bigger total number as greater numbers become hospitalized. So in your experience, what's the best case and the worst case scenario over the next few months now that Omicron is clearly circulating in the UK? So we're really at the stage that it's, it's hard to predict what will happen. And that will depend on the extent to which booster doses protect the elderly who are the most vulnerable to severe illness. And it's too early to say as to how much protection there is. It's the information that's available does, does indicate that booster doses are reasonably effective against Omicron. So get your third, get your booster dose if you're eligible. Um, but at the peak of the epidemic, then the majority of people hospitalized and the great majority of people who were dying were people who were over 80 because the risks of severe outcomes increased so steeply with age. We've seen cases amongst the over 80s decline very steeply as booster jabs have started taking effect. So the real uncertainty is whether those numbers amongst the elderly will start to go up 
because that's where the real pressure on the hospital systems will, will come from. It strikes me that that's one of the two major data points to look at, um, but as well, the general question of severe illness um, is, is the other. There does seem now to be a pivot back to focusing on the infection rate. Over the summer, when the government decided to push for reopening, the focus was on hospitalization rate. Strikes me that the really big question that hopefully we'll have answers sooner rather than later is even if the Omicron variant does undermine the effectiveness of vaccines to some extent when it comes to being infected, does it impact how sick you get? And if the vaccines are still protecting from severe illness, surely that's the major thing to be focusing on. Yeah, so there does, all the indications are is that there is a significant level of protection of mm -hmm. vaccination against severe illness. but the numbers are rising so steeply that the real concern is that even if only a small proportion of those people are becoming seriously ill, that will put pressure on a hospital system that is already under a lot of pressure. Many of our hospitals are working incredibly hard to catch up on the backlog from throughout the pandemic and adding additional COVID cases is, is going to make that worse. So we're already seeing reports of hospitals spending many, ambulances spending many hours outside of hospitals. Um, a number of hospitals have are on the highest level of alert because essentially they're full. And that's before we're seeing any pressure from Omicron. It does, it does seem that these conversations very often come back to NHS capacity. Uh, well, let me ask you on that point, what do you make of the government's announcements this week that we've moved into Plan B? We're going to see um, a push to work from home. Unless you want to attend a Christmas party, then you're going to be encouraged to come to the office. Uh, there's going to be more mass in public spaces and, most controversially, the introduction of vac vaccine passports for large venues. Do you think that these measures are going to curb or at least slow the spread of Omicron? They should help. Um, exactly how much is, is not clear. Um, but I think anything that we can do to limit the spread of the virus without having major consequences for people's liberty and for the economy is something that we should be doing at this stage until the picture becomes clearer. Professor Alistair Grant, thanks for joining us. This week was supposed to be crime week on Monday as Boris Johnson watched Merseyside police raid a house in Liverpool suspected of drug dealing. The government announced ambitious plans to cut drug misuse. Under the plans, 300,000 of the most vulnerable drug users will be targeted for rehabilitation and nearly 800 million pounds will be invested into drug treatment. But drug deaths in the UK this year reached a record high. Is their plan enough? I'm joined now by Dame Carol Black, who suggested many of the proposals taken forward by the government in her independent review of drugs policy and by former Tory leader Anne Duncan Smith. Carol, to you first, what do you make of the official plans the government is bringing in? Well, the plan is in three parts and those three parts are all important. Um, the first part of the strategy is enforcement. So very much uh, home office affairs. The second part, which is the one I know most about, of course, is treatment, recovery and prevention. And that part is based very much on my part two of my report. And then there is a section on recreational drugs where we really as yet do not have a good evidence base for what to do. But I recommended in my review that we had an innovation fund so that we could start to build that evidence base and uh, decide what interventions would really make a difference to quite a difficult problem. And what do you make of the plans? Well, uh, Carol's right how they're structured. I think, um, I think the government is now finally on the right path, uh, but there are some issues obviously that arise with it. I mean, I went through this back in the 2010 to 2016 period when I was in government for six years, where we had already agreed in government that we would do more uh, to move uh, drugs policy over towards rehabilitation and away from what I'd felt to become the pernicious maintenance idea. And put this in context, what happened with the previous Labour government was that they said they were going to tackle drugs and drug addiction. And what they then said 
was that they would have a, a checklist against how many people they had managed to get into treatment. The problem is that they counted anything to do with an intervention as treatment. So those who were maintained on alternative drugs like methadone, etc., many of whom uh, ended up for years rather than months as a pathway drug, stuck on this very addictive drug and at the same time quite often taking illegal drugs as well. Uh, but they were in the tick box marked they were in treatment. When in actual fact, nothing could be further from the truth. And the areas where they really would have been in treatment, such as rehabilitation, either day rehab or uh, um, long stay rehab, uh, these found progressively less and less money available to them. So the warning, uh, we failed at the end of the day to get the policy exactly as we wanted it uh, because too many departments had a very narrow view of their wants. Home office only wanted people subdued, so they were quite happy for them to be years and years on drug substitutes. The health department felt that the whole idea of keeping them out of hospitals as far as possible on substitutes worked. Uh, and therefore the rehabilitation, which is more expensive, but ultimately much more effective, uh, and started to go by the wayside. That's got worse over the last few years. So this government policy now, which will be focused massively in the middle of it on rehabilitation, uh, is a good move, but it's going to be something they have to fund. And the final point I'd make on this, many years ago I visited Sweden. The Swedish policy, which I think is arguably the most successful drugs policy, uh, in the developed world, is where you face addicts with a choice. They either take a criminal route or they go into rehabilitation and they fund their rehabilitation and if you fall out of the rehab you go back into it again until you get clear of it and signed off on it. So that's the position we need to be at but we are some way away from that. Carol, on Anne's point about rehabilitation, when you dig into the policy that's actually being proposed, um, he's right, it is really emphasizing rehabilitation. Not only significant chunks of money now going behind helping addicts to get their lives back on track, but for example, there's going to be a 33% rise in placements for rough sleepers, and the idea now is that if the police come across somebody who is rough sleeping, automatically the assumption should be rehabilitation rather than imprisonment. And yet, the way that the government's been talking at the start of Crime Week um, has been all about the crackdown, all about the enforcement, all about getting tough on crime. Why isn't what we're being sold, the, the rhetoric, the, the short video clips, lining up with what the policy actually entails, which is far more thoughtful? Um, well, indeed, the, the media has picked up on the enforcement but really, they've also picked up on rehab and treatment. And if you really want to get on top of drugs, you have got to reduce demand. You will never reduce addiction by just thinking you can reduce supply. You need at least a 50-50 balance. And what I was trying to do in my report was to bring together a whole systems change so that you will have good clinical care you will have mental health and trauma-informed care, you will have access to safe housing, and you will have the possibility of finding employment. You can't just get on top of addiction by thinking you're just going to provide, as Ian says, a script. This is a whole systems approach requiring central government and requiring local government to work closely together. And I don't think it's just the media that's picked up on the enforcement, though. It's very clear that Boris Johnson and his government want the media to be focusing on the crackdown aspect. Is that because he's worried that voters think that your party is becoming less tough on crime? Look, every government, including the Blair government, uh, needs to catch a headline. Uh, and the truth is that the idea of rehabilitation, that is to say, long-term getting people who are significantly addicted to all sorts of substances, illegal and often legal substances, uh, stable again and, off and, and out and in the world and working, uh, that is not a kind of sexy subject. What is always eye-catching uh, for governments, and particularly for uh, the, the media, uh, is the idea of cracking down on the suppliers and cracking down on people who casually buy drugs, not thinking of the consequences, for crime on the streets, death uh, and uh, violence. And so um, it, it's always going to be like that. But the key question that really uh, is one that I think runs all the way through this is, 
we still need somehow to be able to be talking about this so that we get it done. I know a particularly uh, uh, brilliant rehabilitation centre that changed my focus on how it can be done. It's up in Buxton. It's run by uh, a woman called Noreen Oliver, who herself was an alcohol, uh, addicted to alcohol, and got herself through. And she set up this brilliant rehabilitation centre. If anybody wants to know what rehab looks like, it's about getting people off drug, making sure the doctors are there with them, and at the end of the day, moving them through an employment process so that they're able eventually to move out back into the world of work. It is quite staggering, the success rates of places like hers, but they lie behind the news all the time because nobody really wants to know about that because it's not as sexy as the headline of cracking down. But I honestly recommend to any journalist, if you really want to see what the future could look like, you need to go and visit a place like that. And if you come away uninspired, then you really yourself probably need to go into rehabilitation to re rediscover the great things of life. And in 2018, you were vocal about wanting more stop and search to crack down on the drugs trade, but you also seem very welcoming of this more thoughtful approach that's come in this week to focus on rehabilitation. Have you changed your mind over the past few years? No, 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 no. You, you've got to understand that these things are interlinked. As Carol said earlier, uh, we had the Centre for Social Justice, which I set up, have for years been arguing uh, that there are, there are a number of areas you have to target. You have to interdict the supply of illegal drugs. Uh, you have to try and therefore force the price of illegal drugs up, which we know corresponds with lower levels of drug taking. But critically, you must try and save lives to get people off drugs. So things like stop and search for the police are critical if they're to interdict that supply process and break up the county lines, the gangs, Dealing. I'm in a, in a borough that has often gang warfare going on uh, over drug dealing territories. So you need strong policing. No one argues against that. But uh, as Carol said earlier on, strong policing alone doesn't solve the problem. It just does that point of pushing the price up by making supply much less. And therefore, it puts a squeeze on numbers taking it. But alongside that, you've got to take the people out who are addicted to this rehabilitate them back into society so they don't take drugs and therefore you help squeeze the market demand at the same time. All of this has to be done together. When I made those comments about stop and search, I said the police must have those powers because the young kids, etc., who are moving weapons and drugs around, uh, the gang leaders know that they won't be stopped because of the then regulations uh, and therefore they use them. If you want to stop it, you've got to be able to get the police to be able to do that. But there's a much wider perspective and I've known that for well over a decade with the Centre for Social Justice. Carol, you were talking before about supply and demand when it comes to the drugs trade. And if I look at the basic economics of this, a zero tolerance policy isn't going to quite stack up. The global drugs trade amounts to roughly 1% of worldwide GDP. In the UK alone, it's estimated to be worth roughly uh, $13 billion or, or roughly 10 billion pounds. I mean, you can talk tough, you can threaten the middle class with taking their passports away. A lot of people won't believe it'll actually happen. And even if a few of them do and change their behavior, this is not going to convince everybody to stop taking drugs recreationally. Is a zero tolerance policy, essentially a prohibitionist policy, really the right one? Because even with all the discussion of treatment, which seems very positive, the government hasn't moved away from that principle that it wants to eradicate drugs. It, it, it just doesn't seem like a real possibility to me. Well, as you probably know, in my report, I wasn't asked and neither did I look at legalization or decriminalization of drugs. And I think there was plenty to do without going down that line. You can make this a public health issue. You can make drugs a chronic condition. You can make it a health condition and do all the things that Ian and I have talked about without changing the law. And there is a huge difference between the 300,000 heroin and crack drug dependent people who cause about 49% of serious acquisitive crime about 50% of homicide and occupy a third of our prison places. And the drug dealers earn about nine billion pounds. And the uh, total cost to uh, the UK is 19.2 billion. 
and those who take recreational drugs. People who take cocaine think that this is not a problem, but you really have to remember that cocaine is part of an international drug trade. Every time someone takes their cocaine on a Saturday night, they are driving an international trade that starts in South America through Albanian drug gangs down to people um, on our streets and having their parties. And it drags in young children who become part of, uh, of the county lines system. I don't know, none of us know as yet, what would make someone think twice before they do that? What is it that we have to do to explain and to get a change in behaviour so that people don't think cocaine on a Saturday night is a good thing. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Carol. Over the last nine weeks, Putin has moved more than 90,000 Russian troops to the borders of Ukraine. U.S. intelligence thinks he's preparing for an invasion. In this week's magazine, Owen Matthews says Putin could be more rational than we think. To explain, he joins me now with Angela Stent, a former advisor to NATO's Supreme Ally Commander in Europe. Owen, in the magazine, you look at NATO's response to Russian aggression towards Ukraine. What do you think NATO's getting wrong? Well, for a start, of course, we're not, in fact, responding directly to a Russian aggression yet. We're responding in a way that's predicated by former Russian aggression, and we're responding to a possible Russian aggression. And the evidence for that, um, certainly from the sources that I've spoken to, as widely reported, has been intelligence reports that Putin has not only mobilized troops on the Ukrainian border, but also implemented detailed tactical planning of a possible, um, of a possible uh, invasion. Uh, but my point is actually to take a little bit of a step back and examine the premises on which that response is being made. And the question is, uh, really, of my piece is, given that Ukraine can never join NATO until its conflicts with its neighbours and its border conflicts are resolved, those are just the rules of NATO membership, why are we pursuing a, uh, a policy which uh, essentially puts Ukraine and its territorial integrity front and centre of NATO policy. And I think it's worth uh, questioning or examining uh, the extent to which that is actually destabilizing rather than stabilizing the situation. And in practical terms, we as the West, certainly Britain and the United States and Canada and various other NATO members have been rather active in uh, sub uh, giving military support to uh, Ukraine. And that is being cited by Putin as the proximate cause for his mobilization plans. So the, the issue is really, um, what are we, how can we proceed with Ukraine that signals strongly that UK, Ukraine will be protected in the case of Russian aggression, but at the same time sort of de-escalate the situation with Putin. And in a nutshell, the question is, and it's not a question I ask very often, but it's not, it's not a, something that, that uh, I say very often, but um, is it possible that Putin actually has a legitimate security concern that um, the way NATO is behaving uh, has given him rise to believe that eventually NATO will accept Ukraine as a member, and that is a very clear red line for him. Angela, what do you make of that? Owen questioning whether or not NATO's assistance could be the cause of, not the solution to, Putin's aggression. Well, I think we've got this all wrong, right? The reason why Ukraine has a security problem is because Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014. It annexed Crimea. It invaded the southeastern part of Ukraine. It instigated a war there. The people who are fighting there, they're not separatists. These are Russians and Russian-backed proxies. And um, so they created this instability and, and, uh, and this major military catastrophe, really, for Ukraine and an ongoing war. So to say that somehow Russia should feel threatened, there was absolutely no reason why Russia went in and took Crimea in 2014, except that it wanted to. It had a, a, someone in power in Kiev, uh, President Yanukovych, um, who fled the country uh, because of demonstrations against him. So the origins of this problem are not NATO. It's what Russia did to Ukraine. 
And since then, um, the, as I said, the fighting has gone on. Unfortunately, in 2008 at the Bucharest NATO conference, there was a communique, and this was a result of a compromise between the Germans uh, and French and the Americans, saying that one day Ukraine will join NATO. Um, it would have been better if that language wouldn't have been there, because for the West it means sometime in the very distant future. But obviously the Russians can point to this and say, look, Ukraine might join NATO. But the, you know, the current build-up the, it has really nothing to do with Ukraine threatening Russia. The reason why uh, Ukraine has been getting military assistance is because of this persistent war instigated by Russia. Now, I read um, Owen Matthews' article with interest, um, but I think there's absolutely no proof that if you know, somehow the US and Russia were to decide over Ukraine's head that it's never going to join NATO, whether that would really change Russian behavior. I mean, Putin wants Ukraine to come to heel. He wants a government in Kiev that will be subservient to Moscow. He's essentially said that in all of his writings. That's what his goal is. And the NATO part is the excuse for him uh, to do what he's doing. Owen? All right. Well, Dr. Stent, I mean, I, I certainly bow to your superior um, uh, experience. I mean, you've actually been a, a senior military advisor to, the, uh, to NATO's security as the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. So clearly you have heads on experience. But I would nonetheless take issue with a couple of things you said. Firstly, um, I was actually in Donbass in 2014. And uh, they're not Russians. They're separatists. I mean, there are Russians among them, doubtless. I mean, I, I certainly saw some, some Russian uh, security officers, but I, the vast majority people that I saw on the ground, and I saw hundreds of them, were actually locals of Donbass. They were separatists. So actually to deny that it's uh, a separatist movement is you know, just factually incorrect. Um, the, the, I have no issue whatsoever with your, uh, with your timeline. That's, uh, it, it's entirely true. Putin is to blame um, for the, most of the uh, destabilization within Ukraine, although it must be said that actually even pre uh, Donbass and pre-Crimea, the uh, Ukraine also had a, a different unresolved conflict, and that's Transdniester. So actually, the uh, um, the it's it's not the sole cause of um, Ukraine's problems with potentially joining NATO. And uh, let's be very clear. I mean, I there is uh, uh, I'm not victim blaming here. I'm not saying that the Ukrainians should stop. Um, aspiring to NATO, because indeed, if you're from the point of view of, of, of Ukraine, it is the proximate ally to which to go to protect itself from Russian aggression. However, that being said, I mean, I think there is a, uh, a major uh, dialogue of the deaf going on here, um, that actually uh, the West continues to um, support uh, Ukraine militarily in, frankly, non-militarily decisive ways. That continues to be uh, a, a point of, of major contention with, with Putin and his, uh, what you say is the main excuse for his aggressive actions. Um, all of that is true. But the problem is that um, you, touch, you touch it with a needle. I mean, do we think that actually Putin's long-term intent is actually to reintegrate Ukraine somehow into the Russian Empire. Now, as you rightly say, Dr. Stent, uh, Putin's writings, especially for Putin's writings this year, have uh, based on clear, fundamental misinterpretations, frankly, ignorance of Ukrainian statehood. That's also true. But actually, do we really think that he is an inveterate imperialist that is obsessed with actually reintegrating Ukraine, uh, even at the cost of destroying his own economy? I mean, I frankly don't think that that's the case. Uh, Angela, what do you think? I think the solution to this, and apparently this did come up in the phone call yesterday uh, between Biden and Putin, is to revive the completely dormant Minsk agreements, which haven't gone anywhere, that was supposed to resolve the crisis signed in February of 2015, that the United States should be a full participant in this. At the moment, it's France, Germany, Russia, and Ukraine, and maybe Great Britain, maybe some other countries, but certainly the US, and go back to basics and see if there's some way of working out a diplomatic resolution to this. Now, this w assumes that the Russians want a solution to this, and 
other than, you know, Ukraine saying that we'll never join NATO, and we don't know that, but it should certainly be tried. And so I think that is the way forward at the moment, is to re-engage um, all the parties in these negotiations, see if there's uh, a, a more productive way of resolving the question of the status of, of these two self-declared republics in the Donbass. Owen, oh, a few British MPs are whispering that a war in Europe could be just weeks away. Do you think they're overreacting? Yes, they're overreacting. Um, they're, they're, they're basically sort of swallowing the Kool-Aid and doing Putin's job for him. Because what he wants, the, uh, the reason why you rattle a sabre is because you want people to hear that sabre rattling. So actually all of us are kind of uh, uh, dupes in that sense of actually, of, of Putin. He's, 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 he's staged a credible, uh, creditable, credible stunt. He's mobilized his troops, the troops on the ground, and all of us are actually just helping his agenda by sort of raising the, the temperature. The Ukrainians, it must be said, are, are also party to that, because uh, to, to, to raising the, the, the temperature, because um, uh, I'm not doubting that they seriously believe that there's, a, there's a, a Russian threat with troops massing on your border. Why would you not? But also they have their own agenda, which is actually encouraging um, as NATO to support them as, to a greatest, as great an extent as possible. Um, I, I think actually, I mean, um, security sources that I've spoken to actually that don't see any kind of realistic scenario, and including Ukrainian security sources, don't see any realistic scenario for the kind of widespread invasion um, that um, the mobilization suggests, certainly not from the, in the, from the directions of the troop concentrations from where it's coming, in other words, from the Belarusian border, in other words, threatening Kiev. I mean, that thing, that's not, that's not going to happen. Uh, the, the Ukrainians are actually more worried about uh, the Ukrainian military intelligence people that I've spoken to are m much more worried about a possible sort of salami tactics um, around Mariupol and around the Sea of Azov and that kind of thing. But um, I think neither of those are actually going to happen. I think Putin actually wants to reach a grand deal. And as Dr. Stent has said, once again, like that, uh, you know, you are, you are a NATO insider, so I'm inclined to entrust you uh, to, to, to respect your analysis. I think you're exactly right that actually Minsk is the key to this. And Minsk, like in a tiny nutshell, is um, Ukraine gives internal autonomy to uh, Donbass, to, to Donetsk and Lugansk, um, and Russia, and uh, in exchange, it, it gets control of its own eastern border back again. Angela, last word to you. How do you gauge the current threat level? So I also don't think that an invasion is imminent. Um, <clears throat> I agree completely, and, and particularly a full-scale invasion, you know, where the Russians tried to get to Kiev. That uh, would be a bloodbath. The Russian population is the, doesn't want... Don't, they don't want their sons uh, fighting uh, in Ukraine. There was enough trouble when body bags were coming back in 2014 and 15. So um, this isn't like Crimea that was very popular, the annexation. So there's a, do a domestic uh, aspect to this too. Um, so full-scale invasion going to Kiev is off the table. The salami tactics is possible. Um, they would like to uh, take Mariupol to have a land bridge to Crimea to sort of uh, secure their dominance around the Sea of Azov and everything. But even that would obviously evoke, one assumes that would also evoke the kind of sanctions uh, that we heard about yesterday after the call with uh, between Biden and Putin. So they probably will hold off on that. I think the prospect of sitting down and negotiating uh, will appeal to them because it will show Putin, the Kremlin, that uh, the West takes their concerns seriously. Um, again, going back and seeing how Minsk could be better implemented, um, not having so many disagreements on the sequencing of the implementation of this agreement. Um, so I think, um, I think there's been hype about this that was probably excessive. And in the beginning, the Ukrainians themselves said, no, we're not worried by the Russian troop movements. And it's only more recently uh, that they've changed their tone on this, which is, which is interesting. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think the reason why the US intelligence agencies did get concerned and did apparently brief all of our allies uh, in some detail about what was happening is if you look at the numbers of troops, the formations and the kinds of things you see going on there, it's very hard to have a rational explanation for why that's happening. Um, and you might believe in the end that, in fact, the point is intimidation of Ukraine, getting the U.S. and other countries to the table again. But you can't, if you look at the capabilities and you're not sure about the intentions, you have to at least consider the fact uh, that an invasion might be uh, really possible. Uh, but for the moment, I don't think it is. 
Owen, Angela, thanks for joining Spectator TV. And finally, after some toxic years for Britney Spears, she's come out stronger the other side. In this week's magazine, writer Sarah Dittum reviews a new book called Being Britney, which says that the pop star was devoured by 21st century media and celebrity culture. She joins me now. Sarah, thanks for coming on to the show. You reviewed Jennifer Otter Bickerdyke's book, Being Britney, Pieces of an Icon. What did you make of it? Mm. Um, I think it's um, well-researched, but probably not the kind of final word on Britney Spears that the world is necessarily waiting for. Um, so um, she's obviously done stacks and stacks of research and pulled out loads of detail out of the archives. But at the same time, the story, the sort of overall lineaments of the story she's telling are pretty familiar to anyone who's watched things like, for example, the New York Times documentary that came out earlier this year, um, which is a story of Britney that goes like <clears throat> child superstar, massive success, hunted by tabloids and paparazzi, understandable breakdown, exploited and overtaken by the conservatorship which um, is imposed on her in 2008 and under which her father for the most part um, is able to entirely control and often benefit from her career um, and then up to the present day so it has actually um, was completed and published I think went like the final version went to print just before the conservatorship was wound up which means that it's in the kind of you know <laughs> like I feel bad for her it's awful when you write something and the deadline um, passes before a sort of a major development in the story happens and you're just sort of left going oh, <laughs> like, oh, the story happened without me then, oh, that sucks. Um, and that is unfortunately what's happened to this book. So it kind of, you know, has this sort of question hanging over it, like, can Britney ever be free? And now the answer is yes, yes, she can. And we know that. Um, so on the one hand, it kind of suffers a bit from timing, which is, you know, an inherent problem for anyone writing a book and can't really be held against her. On the other hand, um, the other thing it suffers from is just telling quite a familiar story of what is quite a familiar subject at the moment. Well, you, you say in your review that it also falls within the term known as the Britney revisionist era. What exactly does that mean? Oh, okay. So basically, um, when I talk about the Britney revisionist era, I'm talking about the fact that there's been a really sharp shift in the way we talk about Britney and the way we talk about pretty much all female stars of her era um, over, I would say, kind of the last, you know, 24 months, pretty much. It's been a pretty recent thing that we've gone from a sort of a general understanding that someone like Britney was ruined by essentially her own trashiness in the most unsympathetic version or just bad luck in the more sympathetic version to an understanding that people like uh, Brittany, like Paris Hilton, um, Lindsay Lohan and you know all of the other people who will be remembered as sort of major train wrecks of the noughties um, were actually the victims of a celebrity culture and that and this is true I think like the revisionist interpretation has got a great deal of you know virtue to it because for a very long time, these have all been treated as people who were kind of the authors of their own misfortune um, when they were actually very much experiencing the sharp end of a, you know, a very novel and very cruel form of celebrity that kind of emerges out of the foment of the internet culture, plus a sort of a generally um, scabrous attitude to celebrities that comes up in the noughties. Um, so um, after 9-11, Piers Morgan um, makes this big announcement that he's like he's had it with celebrities and he's not going to have any more truck with like being nice to them um, and makes this 
big and um, like a journalistic statement about how celebrities are going to have to fear him and the mirror from then on um which is only slightly pathetic if you know that the reason he makes that announcement is that he's had a big bust up with richard and judy about copy approval and that his um like the way he kind of enacts that is by starting the 3am girls the gossip columnists but that is kind of the attitude to celebrity that is dominant in the noughties of just essentially screw these people they've got something that they don't deserve and we're going to make them suffer for it this this new narrative doesn't just seem like it's good news for britney seems like it's potentially good news for many of us if not all of us if you look at these sense that um her journey has brought so many unexpected people together. I think it was for a time in the United States that the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, which are just completely on polar opposite ends of the spectrum right now, actually decided to, to unite over the Free Britney cause. I know, and I mean, with the Free Britney thing especially, it has this um, added element of um, sort of reflecting the entire conservatorship issue, which, um, I knew very, very little about before I started um, sort of looking a bit more into Britney's situation. And the more I learned about it, the more I was like, holy heck, California has an actually evil legal system for people ruled mentally incompetent. Um, because it's essentially like, it's the equivalent of power of attorney, but it's so totalizing that it gives so much um, authority to the people who. Um, operate the conservatorship and has so little opportunity for people to be able to actually get out of it once they've been placed under it. And Brittany is obviously, you know, the most high profile person to be under a conservatorship, but it's pulled focused. What is um, essentially a kind of, um, what sounds like a legal battery farming of people's estates in California. And as you can imagine, California is especially ripe for that kind of thing because you have lots of old movie stars who might have very valuable assets that, uh, you know, an unscrupulous attorney can take control of. So, you know, um, so yeah, there are like issues that kind of draw out of these things and can be talked about as wider political issues as well. It's not just, you know, trivial celebrity stuff. Let me ask you one more question. How do you think Britney Spears is going to be remembered? Do you think she'll be remembered for being a pop star sensation or for this case over her conservatorship, which became a struggle for personal freedom? I think it depends an awful lot on what she does now. So. There isn't a huge sense yet of whether she's going to be interested in going back into recording and performing, um, which is obviously, you know, like in the sort of early days of free Britney of the free Britney movement, it kind of starts because she goes on this indefinite hiatus in um, 2019 when she decides she's not going to perform or record anymore because she's basically sick of her dad having so much control over her. Um, so the fans kind of come together because they are motivated by wanting to see her perform again. Um, but nothing she said so far really suggests that she strongly wants to go back to doing that. On the other hand, she's not disowned it either. Um, so she like, um, I think in some of the videos she's made to celebrate her freedom, she's used work bitch as the background music. So it's obviously like still there for her. It's not something that she has totally negative associations with. Um, but at the same time, you know, if she decides at this point that what she actually wants to do is have another baby, get married to her incredibly hot fiance, and just live a relatively quiet life making slightly erratic Instagram videos, I think everybody would be quite happy for her. I think that would work fine. Sarah, thanks for joining us. And that's it for this week. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to The Spectator's YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. Thanks for watching and do join us again next week.